going to be looking at an encounter that Jesus had that uh, turned out to become a confrontation with the Jew Jewish religious leaders. Uh, not that Jesus necessarily started it, but he certainly didn't back away from it. Um, this episode from his life is found in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it's also recorded in the 7th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, but we're going to look at Matthew's version. And uh, it begins with verse 1. So uh, if you'll follow along on your handout, it reads, Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, Explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Okay. Um, in this encounter, uh, Pharisees and teachers of the law travel from Jerusalem to the region of Galilee where Jesus is currently ministering, which indicates that by this point in time, Jesus had drawn the attention of the religious elite from the nation's capital who weren't too pleased with some of the reports that they were hearing about the things that Jesus was saying and doing. Uh, in this particular moment, the Pharisees observe and they ask Jesus why his disciples do not wash their hands before they eat and are therefore breaking the precious heritage of their ancestors. So, in the first century, devoted Jewish people practiced ritual hand washing before eating. And it had very little to do with the physical cleanliness of your hands. But it had more to do with the concept of holiness. And to understand the context of this scripture passage, we have to step back a little bit and get a bigger picture. The story of the Bible is that the world has been wrecked by the rebellion of both human and spiritual beings. And throughout the course of history, we continue to live in this fallen existence. The world is broken. Um, individually, societally, environmentally, in all ways. And God's heart, as evidenced throughout Scripture, is to set things right. And he begins to do this early on by choosing a people, the Hebrews, through whom he is going to repair this brokenness in creation and set things right in the world. In time, these Hebrew people become more than just separate tribes of families. Uh, they become a united people, a nation. And you then will see in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy instructions from God about how they are to live in the world in such a way that they are distinctly God's people. So they are to live in a way that will set them apart from the rest of the world, which captures what it means, in large part, to be holy. 
I think oftentimes when people hear the word holy, they tend to associate that to mean being morally upright or righteous. Someone that you might look at and go, wow, that's a really good person. And although holiness can include that idea, it's really more about being separate. God himself is holy in the sense that he's unique. He is separate. He is distinct. There is no one like him. And so holiness for the Israelites was more about being dedicated to God, set apart and consecrated to God, sharing in his holiness through the revelation in his laws of how we're to live in this world. And this law of Moses has quite a bit to say about what's called ritual impurity. And it's important for us to distinguish that it's ritual impurity because that implies that the impurity takes place while performing rituals in the presence of God, which therefore is primarily related to priests who came before God on behalf of the people. To not be ritually pure in the presence of God could be very, very bad for your health. And, you know, something else that I think we need to keep in mind is that ritual purity is not the same thing as sinfulness. It's not tied to morality in that sense. Uh, you can become ritually impure for a whole host of reasons, none of which means that you necessarily did anything bad in an ethical sense. Uh, if you touch a dead animal, uh, if you're in contact with certain bodily fluids, if you become sick or diseased, there are quite a number of things that could make you ritually impure. And for a priest, that would then mean that you cannot carry out your religious duties. And in order to then become ritually clean again, there were very strict processes that needed to take place, such as uh, waiting for a period of time, kind of like being in quarantine, uh, going through a ritual bathing procedure, offering a specific sacrifice, at the end of which the individual would then be ritually pure again and could be in the presence of God. Now, hand washing in the sense that the Pharisees are accusing Jesus' disciples of not practicing before they eat, is not specifically mentioned in the Levitical laws. Hand washing is mentioned, and I think maybe only mentioned, in Exodus, where Moses and Aaron are told to wash their hands and feet before approaching the altar in the tent of meeting. But again, as I mentioned before, this was more specific to their context in their priestly roles and being in the presence of God. This tradition of hand washing outside of the temple is a much later development, which scholars believe likely became a symbolic act of reverence to, toward God and also reverence towards scripture, which many people believe uh, was now circulating in written form. Not all 39 books of the Old Testament, but certainly the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, were already written. They were likely codified and when when one handled scripture, it's believed that the washing of your hands was important because you're handling something very sacred. But at some point, hand washing extended even further out, involving more people. And it also began to include certain other times when it was to be, be performed, including uh, before and after a meal, when you first wake up in the morning, before you might pronounce a blessing on someone, as well as other times. And again, uh, none of these are specifically mentioned in the law of Moses. The, uh, these are traditions that formed over the course of time, in which by the time of Jesus were taken very seriously and were held by many to have the force of law. The Pharisees note that Jesus' disciples are breaking with this long-standing tradition and they're not washing their hands before they eat. Now we hear this, and I think we probably have a gut reaction to agree with the Pharisees. Yeah, they should wash their hands before they eat. But of course, we are coming from a 21st century mindset with our understanding of germs and bacteria, and none of that knowledge was available in the first century. The washing of hands before a meal, as it was done in Jewish culture at that time, had very little to do with hygiene. It was more about this idea of being ritually, ritually pure. Because the thought was, your hand might have touched something that was impure. Maybe, for instance, you brushed up 
against the cloak of a passing Gentile person, God forbid. And then this impurity would then be on your hands that then transferred to your food that you touched, which you then consumed, thereby making you impure, regardless of whether there were any germs involved or not. The Pharisees, in effect, are chastising Jesus for breaking this established hand-washing tradition. And Jesus turns the table on them and says, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? In response to their question, Jesus asks them a question. As we talked about in our last series, Jesus often answered questions with questions of his own. And then he says to them, For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So this is kind of an interesting elaboration to Jesus' question that uh, we need to spend a little bit of time understanding because I'm guessing some of you might be wondering, what's he talking about there? The law of Moses required people to honor their parents. It is the fifth of the Ten Commandments, the commandments that were held to have paramount importance to the Jewish people. All the law was considered sacred, as it should be, but the Ten Commandments had a very special place. So honoring your father and mother was a very big deal. And the term honor didn't suggest mere lip service. It included the idea of caring for them in their various needs throughout the entirety of their lives. Some of the Jews, however, had allowed for what over time became kind of a scheme to avoid that responsibility. A practice developed whereby individuals could designate certain of their financial resources as dedicated to God, an act that became known as korban. And you, you can read about this. Mark's version of, the gospel, of this encounter in the seventh chapter of his gospel explains it a little bit more. The Greek word korban uh, comes from the term korbanas, signifying temple treasury. So in Jewish practice, the word korban had been coined as sort of a vow. Now, according to the prevailing tradition that had developed by the time of Jesus, one could designate his financial resources as korban, which practically speaking was a way of tagging them, suggesting that, well, now this belongs to God and thus was not to be used any further for personal interests. The Jewish historian Josephus uses this term when referring to the fact that Funds from the temple treasury were korban, hence they could not be used for secular purposes, like uh, public building improvements or building an aqueduct for water supply or things of that nature. And even here at our church, right, we have a fund that we keep in, into which we put 10% of all of our tithes and offerings. And I think I've mentioned this before. And funds that go go into this account, account aren't to be used for normal church operating purposes, but they're designated as korban, if I could use that term, in that they're set aside for benevolent purposes, like missions or giving to other organizations or helping people in our community who are in need. So a tradition developed amongst the Jewish people and it was supported by the religious leaders whereby an individual could designate his or her resources as korban, set aside for God, and therefore not available for personal purposes. Although historians will point out that there were ways for them to get around this. It sounds kind of pious, but in reality this practice, this tradition, was now being used specifically by individuals in order to protect their resources and create this end around over their responsibility to fulfill the law regarding the honoring of your father and mother. And Jesus is calling them out on this. In fact, he, to me, seems a little bit ticked over this matter. He calls them hypocrites from the Greek word hypocrites, which stood for an actor who was on a stage, an individual who pretends to be someone who they are not. 
Jesus is implying that these religious leaders publicly present themselves as being fully committed to the law, and yet their actions betray that they're willing to circumvent the law based on authority that they've given to human tradition. And in the process, they demonstrate that their hearts are not in line with what the spirit of the law was all about in the first place. I mean, what good is it to honor the letter of the law, or in this case, the letter of the tradition, even if it might seem admirable, if you fail to truly love God and other people in the process? What good is an oath of dedication in this manner if it victimizes people who are in need? And then he turns this time into a teaching moment. And he calls the crowd over to him and he says, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth doesn't defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. So here Jesus announces that the ritual hand-washing tradition is ultimately unimportant because true defilement originates elsewhere. And, and in this statement, he's making a sweeping claim about Jewish dietary restrictions. If you go back to the Mosaic Law, there's a good amount of it that's dedicated towards instructing the Israelites about what they could and what they could not eat. And we don't have time to review all of that. Some of it's included in Leviticus chapter 11 and includes things like <clears throat> pigs, rabbits, bats, shellfish, camels, chameleons, eagles, vultures, weasels, rats, Ugh, rats and frogs and there's others and the Jewish people are commanded by law not to eat these don't eat these God says or you will become defiled so what is Jesus saying here is he superseding the law because it sure seems like it and this isn't really the first time that he's done something of this nature as I've discussed several times before, 10 chapters earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will make statements like, you have heard it said, and then he'll quote a commandment from the law, like do not commit murder, which was generally understood to be the taking of someone's physical life. But then he'll say, but I tell you, if you even harbor anger, and you've already committed the act of murder in your heart. And so in doing this, Jesus is redefining the boundaries of the application of the law. It's quite a bold claim on his part. In this case, he's making an even bolder claim. Now, you have to imagine, if you were one of those people that drew closer when Jesus drew people to him, and you heard him say, nothing you put into your mouth makes you unclean. Those words right there would have stopped you in your tracks because all faithful Jews were very well aware of the dietary restrictions from the law of Moses that were handed down, that were integral to their life and culture that had been around from generation to generation to generation for literally more than a thousand years. And I'm sure they were standing there thinking, what? are you saying? Are you saying we are no longer restricted from eating the foods that we've actually been commanded not to eat? And they probably were looking around at each other saying, can he do that? Can he essentially veto Leviticus 11? Who does he think he is? Well, if you fast forward, you'll find later on in the minds of the early Christians and gospel writers, this is the very conclusion they come to. Mark's rendering of this encounter ends with him point-blank saying that Jesus, by saying this, essentially rendered all foods clean in the 19th verse of chapter 7 of his gospel. But certainly at the time that Jesus made this statement, it was extremely controversial, if not even scandalous. And even Jesus' own disciples, they seem to be a little bit taken back uh, by his comments. And they approach Jesus and they ask, um, 
do you, do you know that what you said kind of made them mad? They're really upset, Jesus. Do you maybe, do you, might you want to clarify? Do you want to backpedal? Do you, did you really mean that? And Jesus doubles down on his criticism of them and says, leave them. They're blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. And then he further explains to Peter and the disciples that it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles and makes someone unclean, but it's what comes out of the mouth. It's what we say, the words we choose. These are the things that betray that the heart is already defiled and impure. So Jesus is making some pretty giant claims here, and in the process, he's getting back to the heart of the matter, which for him always deals with the heart. Now, in this encounter, I think Jesus demonstrates a side to his personality that doesn't get a whole lot of press. Right? People tend to want the compassionate, soft, empathetic Jesus. They want that side of Jesus. But interestingly, he normally demonstrates that softer, more graceful side towards people who are outsiders or to those who are poor or disadvantaged, or even towards those who have been caught in sin. But this more indignant, harsher side of Jesus tends to come out when he witnesses people who use their position or authority to oppress other people, or who present themselves as self-righteous, and yet harbor attitudes of privilege and entitlement. In this case, he's upset that the Pharisees have not just allowed, but they've instituted human traditions that have become burdensome to the people. And then they've dared to elevate the authority of these traditions and enforced these traditions as if they carried the weight of God's law. And then they use that to criticize him. And the truth is, how often have we done the same thing? How many times have we established and maintained cultural or societal or religious traditions without looking honestly at whether the maintaining of these human traditions are really continuing to reflect and build God's kingdom in this world. So I have a film clip that I'm going to show you. Uh, it's a clip from the movie Fiddler on the Roof. It's an old movie. I think oh, I actually showed a clip from this movie before. And it's a musical. Okay, so there's singing that's going to happen in here, old-fashioned kind of singing, so it's going to be a little bit different. But this movie is about Russian Jews living in the early 1900s. And one of the primary themes throughout this movie is about the place and the purpose of traditions in the life of early 19th century Jews living in Russia and dealing with the changing worldview of their inhabitants who are becoming more and more progressive in their thinking. So let's go ahead and play this clip. And then I'll close with some comments. Tradition, according to Tevye, <clears throat> is what keeps the people of Anatevka balanced. Tradition tells them what they're to wear, what to eat, how to sleep, how to work. It guides their daily interactions, providing them with guidance as to you know, who does what, when, where, and how. And holding to tradition is very important to Tevye. Although you heard him say that he actually has no idea where these traditions got started. And I would guess, <clears throat> if you were to ask the Pharisees in our scripture passage, they couldn't tell you exactly when the tradition of hand washing got started either. Or any of the other myriad rituals that became part of the Jewish culture and tradition as well. Now, <clears throat> I know if, as you watch this scene, there are traditions reflected in this early 20th century of Anatevka that are quite outdated, right? <laughs> the traditional roles that men and women fulfilled in those days have changed considerably in our culture, and I think rightfully so. And even though I know that there's still inequality in the workplace among men and women here in our country, I actually just read an article during the week that said that the workforce here in our country is now more than 50% female. Now, that probably would have been unthinkable, even a generation ago. You know, when traditional thinking, and especially I would say in the church, probably would have discouraged that trend. 
which highlights one of the points that I believe we can take from this encounter in Jesus' life. Tradition, just for tradition's sake, can become problematic if the adherents of that tradition forget what the purpose behind the practice of that tradition was meant to produce. So let's just stay with church here for a moment. Most everything we do here on Sundays is tradition. That scripture be taught and Jesus is exalted and God is praised, those are certainly foundational purposes for the church that will never change. But how that's accomplished and the manner in which it's done, that's part of our tradition. From the style of music that we use in worship, <clears throat> to the number of songs that we play, to the format of our teaching with my standing up here, essentially giving a lecture while you sit in chairs and face me, to the manner in which we take communion, take part in the prayer wall, even to the food and refreshments that we provide after the service. These are our traditions, which quite frankly isn't all that much different from what's going on at most, most other churches around our country, except maybe the food part. And traditions are not good or bad in and of themselves, but they're not of paramount importance to the church. Traditions in our context here at our church, are meant to draw us into a deeper awareness of God's presence and his love and his purpose in our lives. And if they aren't, then they've lost their effectiveness and they're subject to change. But how many battles have been waged? How many wars have been fought? How many churches have been split over tradition? And not just <clears throat> in the church, but in our own personal lives, right? We've all grown up in a very specific cultural context within a specific family of origin where tradition has impacted us much more than we probably know. And we need to be careful that we don't allow the influence of our traditions to keep us from truly experiencing God's presence, but also from being God's presence to the rest of the world. And so I'm actually just going to end it there. There was more I wanted to say, but I knew I was going to run out of time. Um, <clears throat> might pick this up at another time. But let's go ahead and pray as we close. Lord, um, I do believe there's so many times that we tend to construct an image of you in our minds that's not accurate. There were certainly times where you became indignant, Lord, where you became a little bit ticked off at the way that people were oppressing other people or the ways in which we tend to uh, allow our lives, Lord, to be dictated or ruled by traditions or any human ty kind of institution that uh, keeps us, Lord, from the spirit of the law, from the heart of God, from his vision of what creation and humanity was meant to be. Um, I think here at our church, we should be mindful of that, Lord. We should be mindful of how tradition has certainly impacted uh, our lives so very much. Um, and we should be open, Lord, to your spirits leading us towards ways in which we're able or to allow other people to experience you in ways that are relevant to where they're at. Um, so thank you for our time. Of being able to dig into your word. I know it's a little bit heavy today in terms of like getting in underneath some of the details, but I pray you'll use that, Father, to continue to uh, build our faith, Lord, uh, as individuals and as a church. Uh, we thank you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.